Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And we do that by bringing in guests, Christian scientists and Christian apologists, who bring their expertise in their area of science and share it with us to validate God's Word. And today we have a great guest with us. Uh, Dr. Jason Lyle is with us, and Dr. Lyle is, has a Ph.D. in astrophysics. And uh, our show today is going to be creation astronomy. And as I reflect back over the shows that we've done, we've had a lot of geologists who are excited to talk about creation, but not so many uh, astronomers. And uh, so we're really excited that you're here. Well, thanks. It's going to be on the show. I'd like to tell the folks just a little bit about you. I have this paragraph from your bio that I wanted them to hear. It says, most astronomers and astrophysicists today believe in a secular naturalistic origin of the universe, a big bang that allegedly happened billions of years ago. And few are willing to accept what the Creator Himself has said about the beginning of all things as it's recorded in the pages of Scripture. But you look through, the, you look at the sky, you look at the stars, and what you see in astronomy, you believe, totally validates and complements the Word of God. Well, that's right. We all have a worldview. We have a way of looking at things. And I look at it from the perspective that God's Word is true. And that's different than my secular colleagues who look at it from the perspective that naturalism is true. Now, I have to ask you, when you're at the University of Colorado getting your Ph.D., did any of your professors agree with you? No. But, it's not as far as I know, anyway. But they were, they were able to accept your work and, the, val and, and uh, the validity of your work, even though you guys weren't coming from the same place. That's right. Of course, most of the work that I did uh, didn't involve origins directly. But nonetheless, they, they said that I did a great job in terms of my doctoral dissertation. Well, I'm sure that you did. And uh, I think it's a higher praise. When we have people who don't agree with us completely but still have to acknowledge the validity of our work, I think that's high praise. In fact, that kind of brings us to our presentation today. We're going to talk about creation astronomy. And the, uh, the first verse that jumps into my mind is that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Um, talk about that. Well, there's something about the universe that just uh, when you look at it, you just you, you think of God. It's, it's, it's His handiwork, and God designed it that way. He designed it so that we could see His glory in creation. And people, when they look at the sky, they cannot honestly say that there is no God. I, I think that's absolutely true. In fact, I think the whole creation evolution debate is sad because not only does evolution take us away from the truth, but I think it it robs us of, of the wow factor of our God. It really does, yeah. And uh, we live in a day when we need a big God, not a little God, and the real God is a big God. Well, that's right. He's a God of creation. We're thrilled you're here today. Will you share with us what God's put on your heart to share? Certainly. I thought we'd start by looking at some of these things that, uh, that bring glory to God. And one of those is the incredible beauty that we see in the universe, something that, that we get to do at the Creation Museum. We have these stargazers evenings where we look through telescopes. We take a look for at the moon, for example. And a lot of times when people look at the moon through a telescope, they're just they're blown away by the beauty of it. It's, it's kind of a magnificent desolation, as one of the astronauts put it. Magnificent desolation. Yeah. And one of the interesting things is people sometimes at these stargazers events, they say, can you see the flag that the astronauts <laughs> left on the moon? I say, no, you can't quite see that. We, you know, the moon is about the size of the United States, just to give you a comparison. Uh, but we can, with, with spacecraft, we can actually see the lunar module that they left on the surface. So really? I'd, like to, I'd like to point that out to you. Great. There's actually, if you can see here on our, on our slide, this, uh, we got an arrow pointing to it. Let me circle it here for you. That's the... Uh, the uh, Apollo 11 lander, and so that's actually where the astronauts land. Of course, they left the bottom part of the spacecraft, that spider-looking thing, to save fuel. And it's still there, and so we can actually see that now. So we really did go to the moon for all that's those right. naysayers that, <laughs> let's say, we didn't really go there. So. You can show them yeah. through the telescope. That's awesome. Yeah, pretty amazing that we can see that. In fact, the Apollo 14, you can actually see the, uh, not only the, the lunar module over here, but you can also see the, the footprints that the astronauts left as they walked from the lunar module over to where they left the scientific instruments. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. 40-year-old footprints. Prince, and they're not going anywhere because the moon has no weather, and so it's gonna, they're going to stay there for, uh, presumably for quite some time. Now, as we got even deeper into space, you can see these beautiful star fields. There's actually star clusters, like you can see this uh, star cluster right down here in the lower uh, right. And then up in the left, especially, you can have these, this beautiful uh, that red that you see up there. That's a nebula, and that nebula is Latin for cloud. Yeah, but it's not a cloud like, like we have in, in our sky. It's a cloud of hydrogen and helium gas. And they're beautiful, stunningly beautiful. And you can see these uh, even in a small telescope. Really incredible. Uh, again, you can see all kinds of different nebulae. This is the, the famous Eagle Nebula. You've seen probably these Hubble pictures. By the way, this is false color. The Eagle Nebula is actually red. 
Sometimes uh -huh. they enhance the colors a little bit, not to be deceptive, but they want to do some science. They want to bring out certain features. And so it's, there's an incredible amount of beauty in space. Certainly it declares God's glory. God's not only an incredible scientist, he's quite an artist. That's right. And he, he paints on a very big canvas, too, you, as you can see here. Here we have a star that's blowing off uh, gas in two directions. That's a bipolar planetary nebula. It's dynamic, so it changes over the centuries, interestingly. All of this is out of uh, the Hubble telescope. That's right. Telescope. That's yeah. right. So the neat thing is these were, these were there for thousands of years, and nobody knew about them. Right. Who knows what other gems God has out there just waiting for us? All kinds of different planetary nebulae. These things are just so beautiful. They the, really the, are. The first that I learned how to find myself was the ring nebula. You can see this in a small telescope on a clear summer evening. Huh. Just, it's so weird. It's this little smoke ring hanging there in space, suspended on nothing, looking like this little cosmic Cheerio. Uh, it's, it's very different than, than anything uh, else in space, so really beautiful. And then all those things are in our galaxy, and there are other galaxies out there. And this is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's one of the first where they discovered this, this lovely spiral structure that you see here with the, the spiral arms stretching out. And what you're seeing there is billions of stars. And that's about as far out as we go, isn't it, the Whirlpool? Well, that's one of the nearby galaxies, oh, sorry, actually. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, we can go out even deeper now. Now, yeah. this was one of the first that they actually could see that spiral structure, though. And so if we uh, go out even deeper into space, you find all kinds of great galaxies, galaxies of tremendous beauty, um, like the Sombrero Galaxy. Yeah. And you can see why they call it that. It looks like that flying saucer kind of shape. This was one of the first. You can see this in a small telescope. And you can even see that dust lane there. Not, as quite, not quite as nice as the Hubble image that you see here. But isn't that stunningly beautiful? Let's galaxies see. upon galaxies. These are, this is every speck you see there. That's a galaxy. 100 billion stars each. 100 billion stars in each one of those bright spots. That's right. And you know, the Bible says God has a name for each one of those stars. That's a magnificent God that we serve. Now you're talking about how far out can we go. This is about how far out we can go. This is a very small section of space up near the Big Dipper that they pointed the Hubble telescope. Every one of those little specks, it's not a star. It's a galaxy. And we estimate there may be 100 billion galaxies in the universe, one for each star in our own. Now that's a magnificent God. Jason, that, that makes me feel very small, and it makes me see God as very big, and I think maybe that's reality. I think that's the point. I think that's yes. why he did it that way. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and if you think about it, God did this all. Of course, he says he did it in six days. Most of this was done in one day on day four. Yeah. Because, and, and I love the way the Bible describes the creation of all these hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars. It's summed up in this little phrase, he made the stars also. Yeah. Just like it was just so easy for him to, yeah, <laughs> to spread those out into space like that. So really incredible. No wonder he rested on the seventh day. Yeah, well, and that, again, of course, it's not like God needs to rest. No. But he knew we would. He was and setting so he a did pattern that. for us. That's right. That's he right. made it as a pattern for us. But what work he did. Mm. Wow. What I thought I would do then is talk about some other verses where the Bible touches on astronomy. And my point is, when the Bible touches on astronomy, it's right. And we'd have to all agree that with these verses today. So, for example, the Bible talks about the spherical earth. You've probably heard young earth creationists, oh, they're like flat earthers. <laughs> well, apparently they haven't read the Bible because the Bible talks about the earth being round like a, uh, like a circle. And it's described in Isaiah 40, 22, where, where God describes it. He says it's like the circle of the earth. Or in Job uh, 26, 10, which is, I think, an even better one, it says God inscribes a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. It's indicating that this is a spherical planet. And now you're back to perhaps the oldest book in the Bible. You know, if you look in most textbooks, they will not credit the Bible with that discovery. They'll say, oh, no, Pythagoras, he was the first to come up with this idea that the earth might be round. But that's 500s B.C. Job, we think, is around 2000 B.C. So God's got him beat by, by quite a period of time. Yeah. Years. Wow. And then Aristotle is usually the first to be credited with uh, proving the earth's round. By the way, the idea that Christopher Columbus was the first to come up with that idea is a myth. People already knew the world was round at the time of Columbus. But you'd be surprised how often we hear that. Yeah. He just thought it'd be faster to go that way. So, lots of verses like that. The earth floats in space, hangs on nothing, according to, to Job 26.7. Uh, Great, uh, now it's a poetic passage to be sure, but it accurately describes the earth hanging there in space, hanging on nothing but gravity. Wonderful description, isn't it? As you go through those verses, I, I think you said a very profound thing that I just want our listeners to grab a hold of. That is that we wouldn't really call the Bible a science book. I think it's a salvation book. Yeah. But when it speaks to science, because God always speaks the truth, everything it says about science is true, even though it's mostly a salvation book. Would you agree with that? Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, science textbooks, we need to update those every now and then because we don't know everything. Sometimes right. we get some facts wrong. There will never be a Bible 2.0. God got it right the first That's time, right. and so we can trust it. Uh, we, we, the Bible talks about the expansion of the universe. In, in, it's that same passage, actually, Isaiah 40, 22. It talks about the circle of the earth. God stretches out the heavens as a curtain. And that was something that uh, secular scientists didn't discover until the 1920s. But that was something that the Bible talked about 
millennia before that. And so it's, it's, I think that's really interesting. There's really no way you could know that uh, without modern science except by revelation from God. And I think that's a confirmation that we really do have a, a God who knows what he's talking about and he inspired his word. And some people, by the way, have said, well, does that mean there's a big bang? You know, it, because, you know, you've got this expanding universe. Does that mean it exploded into existence billions of years ago? And my answer is no. Just because something's getting bigger doesn't mean it exploded into existence billions of years ago. Perhaps, perhaps some of our viewers are expanding a little bit. That doesn't mean they exploded into existence billions of years ago, does it? No, it doesn't. So that's, the, that's a logical fallacy, something we'll talk about on a later, uh, right. a later uh, show. But, uh, and by the way, some people have said, well, the Big Bang at least predicted that expansion. It did not. This expansion was discovered in the 1920s. The Big Bang came along in 1931 to explain that expansion from a natural, naturalistic point of view. But you see, the Bible talked about this in advance. Okay. The Bible talks about the conservation of mass and energy. Basically, the amount of stuff in the universe is constant. Now, that's what we'd expect, uh, given what the Bible says, because everything was made by God. God upholds what he made. And so we'd expect nothing's going to cease to exist, and God's not going to bring anything else into existence, because he's done. He ended his work on the seventh day, the Bible tells us. And so, uh, it, you know, those, those two principles combined are what we call conservation of mass and energy. So there are no new galaxies being made now? Well, there's no new material being made now. I, okay. I, I think that's probably true that there's no new galaxies forming as well. You can rearrange existing matter okay. and make new things, but there's no new stuff coming into existence or ceasing to exist. And that is a, that's a biblical principle. James Joel is usually credited with the, the discovery of that, but as far as I can tell, the Bible got it right centuries earlier. Amen. Not surprising considering it's the, it's the very word of God, so when it touches on science, it's right. The Bible indicates that there are countless numbers of stars. It describes Abraham's descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, which, in, which is a, a figure of speech indicating an uncountable number. I know that because it says which cannot be numbered for multitude. Now, of course, God knows the number. He, he counts the number of stars, the Bible tells us, but we couldn't estimate that. You know, that might have been hard to believe when it was first written because the number of stars you can see with your naked eye, a few thousand. This is a big number, but you could count it. And then we, we discovered uh, telescopes. We invented telescopes and we looked down to space and you see this little, this little star cluster that you have here. That maybe has 100,000 stars in it right there. There's no way you could count all that. We think there's maybe 100 billion stars in our galaxy or more. You couldn't count that number in your lifetime. That's why it's only an estimate. And so. How true is this? I mean, the scientific insight has given us even, even more appreciation for, for this verse, how true it is. So there, there are literally, if 100 billion galaxies, there's stars way beyond what we could even estimate. That's right. You have no way of knowing how many stars are in each galaxy. That's right. We can, I mean, we can make an estimation, but sure. it's a rough estimation. We, we couldn't possibly count that number is the point. And so the Bible is certainly right when it talks, when it touches on astronomy, it's right. Amen. Now, here's the point. When people try to make the secular ideas agree with the, um, with, with the Bible, as, as is common today, a lot of Christians want to say, well, yes, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I want to believe in the latest, what are really pagan ideas. You see, it's not scientific ideas, it's pagan ideas, the idea that the universe is millions of years old and so on, or that everything came about by natural processes. People want to have it both ways, perhaps to be academically respectable. Uh, it's easy to be an academic for the Lord. It's hard to be a fool for Christ. And that's something we need to keep in mind. And so people will modify the Bible. Oh, it can't really mean that. And uh, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're thinking that way, you haven't learned the lesson of history. Because what we've seen is that in the past, when the secular scientists of the day disagreed with God's word, God's word was always right. And today we'd have to agree with that. Right? Amen. I and so uh, I, what I wanted to do, I thought I'd talk about some verses where even today, scientists, most scientists, have not caught up. And they'd say, the Bible, oh, but, but the Bible's wrong here. We finally outsmarted God. No, no, no. It's just we haven't caught up yet. And one of those issues is concerning the age of things. How, how long ago did God create? How long did it take him? The Bible makes it clear that God created in six days and rested one day. That's a pattern for us. It's where we get our work week. And yet most of the astronomers that I know believe in billions of years. They believe the universe popped into existence billions of years ago. But you know there is scientific evidence that confirms that God really did create thousands of years ago. And I thought I'd touch on some of those if that's all right. We have, for example, the excess internal heat of the planets. Uh, Jupiter gives off more heat, than it, more energy than it receives from the sun. And so it's like a big battery that's running down. When you give more than you get, you're losing energy. And uh, it can't do that forever. It's kind of like, you know, you take a potato out of the microwave. It's nice and warm. It's not going to stay that way. It's radiating heat into space. Eventually, you're going to have a cold potato. Well, Jupiter's a much bigger potato. It can do that for a lot longer. It can do it for a few thousand years. But if it's really billions of years old, why does it still have this internal energy? Yeah. And that's a problem in the secular uh, worldview. 
Problems even worse with Neptune, which gives off 2.7 times as much heat as it receives from the sun. And so that's a problem in the secular scenario, but it makes perfect sense if they're a few thousand years old. Uh, you might know about Earth having this magnetic field. That's what causes your compass to point north. And magnetic fields are caused by currents. Maybe you've uh, hooked up a battery to a, a loop of wire. You can make a little sure. magnet that way. Yeah. And in fact, I've done that before. Perhaps you have too. And, but the problem is that current runs down after a while. And so you see over the years, as we measure the field strength of the Earth's magnetic field, it drops. It, it decreases with time. And again, that's just, that's just loss of, uh, of usable energy as it's, as it's recycled back into the environment. And so that's exactly what we'd expect. And it's consistent with a few thousand years. Is it's right? not consistent with millions of billions of years. In fact, it's very difficult to make the Earth's magnetic field more than a few thousand years old because if you're, it's an exponential decay. And so if you run it back in time, it gets so strong it starts ripping the iron out of your blood. And it doesn't take millions or billions of years for that to happen. So it's, a, it's certainly a confirmation of thousands of years. The thing I found interesting was to find that other planets also have that. Uh, Jupiter, for example, has an enormous magnetic field. It'd be bigger than the sun, if you could see it. And uh, it's, how, how is it still so strong if it's billions of years old? And the answer is, it's not billions it's, of years old. It's thousands, yeah. not billions. That's right. And uh, Uranus and Neptune as well, these planets that are farther out than uh, Saturn. Uh, Uranus is actually tilted on its side, so it, it kind of rolls around the sun, as it were. It's, and, uh, and the magnetic field is tilted as well. It doesn't line up with the rotation axis, so it, it wobbles. Uranus is just really messed up on a number of levels. And I, I have to wonder if maybe God did it that way just to, uh, to make, kind of poke fun at the evolutionists a little bit, just to get them thinking a little bit. <laughs> because this, this does not make sense in a secular scenario. This is a design feature. And uh, I, I would say if you measure the magnetic field of Uranus, it's consistent with thousands of years. In fact, a, a friend of mine, Dr. Russ uh, Humphreys, have you, ever, have you had him on the show yes, before? Yes, we have. Okay, yeah. So he's a, he's a brilliant uh, physicist and a creationist, and he uh, actually predicted the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune before they were measured by Voyager spacecraft based on 6,000 years of decay, and his predictions were right. Wow. The evolutionist predictions way off because they were, they were thinking billions of years. But these planets are only thousands of years old. So you see it's consistent with uh, biblical creation, the time scale of biblical creation. You know, comets are another indication of the youth of the solar system, the idea it's not really billions of years old. You see comets, of course, they have uh, these uh, tails, and that's, that's because that's actually material that's being blasted away from the comet. Comets are made up of ice and dirt, and when they come close to the sun, which they do in their orbit, they have an elliptical orbit swinging by the sun, some of that icy material is blasted away into space, and that's actually what forms a comet's tail. And so for that reason, comets can't last forever. Every time you see a comet, it's getting smaller. And so it can't do that forever. We estimate, based on the material that's being lost, we can measure that. We estimate that a comet can last a few thousand years maximum. And then after that, it's, it's gone. In fact, I've actually seen comets being disintegrated in one pass. I use the SOHO spacecraft in part of my research. And I've seen comets swing behind the sun. And that's it. They don't come out the they other side. They don't come out They're, the other side. Yeah. The heat. That they're totally obliterated. Melt, basically, and it falls away. They're yeah. totally obliterated in one pass. And so huh. that's. That, it, now, my secular colleagues are aware of this. They know comets don't last billions of years. And so they said, well, there must be a comet generator because we know the solar system is billions of years old. So there must be this, this source of new comets, which they call an Oort cloud, this uh, undetectable uh, source of uh, spherical sort of region where these new comets, let's call them potential comets, are thrown into the inner solar system to become new comets as the old ones are depleted, you see. <laughs> but as it turns out, of course, if I were to ask them, is there any observational evidence? But, of an Oort cloud, they would say, if they're honest, they would say, no, you really, can't, you really can't see the Oort cloud. And so as far as I can tell, it's just a rescuing device to save their position from what at least seems to be contrary evidence. So far as we can tell, the only place the Oort cloud exists is in the mind of some scientist trying to make an excuse. It's in their minds and yes. in the textbooks as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even the moon is an indication that the solar system is not billions of years old. The moon is actually moving away from the Earth due to tidal forces. It causes tides on the Earth, and the Earth rotates quicker than the moon. Those tides pull forward on the moon, giving it energy, and that causes it to move away. And you know, we can actually measure that. We can actually measure it. It's about an inch and a half a year. It's not very much. But you run it back in time, and you would find that if you go back uh, 6,000 years, the Earth and the moon would have been about 730 feet closer. Not a big deal, really, considering it's 240,000 miles away. But if you run the equation backwards, uh, even 1.5 billion years, the Earth and Moon would have been touching. 
which means they can't be 4.5 billion years old. And so that's really a big problem in the secular point of view, but it certainly is consistent with biblical creation. For that matter, even uh, spiral galaxies are an indication of thousands, not billions of years for the universe, because they rotate differentially, which means the inner portions rotate very quick, the outer portions rotate slow, so they're constantly twisting themselves up. And if they were really uh, billions of years old, they'd be a twisted mess, like you can see here in this uh, final frame. And we just don't find galaxies like that. We find galaxies that are nice, beautiful spirals, and that indicates that they are not billions of years old. If they were even one billion years old, you wouldn't see any spiral structure left in them. So spiral galaxies are an indication that our universe, and the universe is full of spiral galaxies, the universe is not billions of years old, as my secular colleagues believe. Jason, you've got some very persuasive evidence there validating the Word of God. And you've got some more good stuff for you, but we have to take a break. So don't you go away. We'll be right back. We are back with Dr. Jason Lyle, and he's giving us evidence from astronomy that validates the truth of God's Word, that God made the world in six days and thousands, not billions of years ago. And the next thing that you have here on your notes is the distant starlight problem. Dr. Jason, would you talk about that? Certainly. And this is a problem that uh, occurs in, in uh, creationary literature. You'll find that evolutionists will say, well, you can't have a young universe because there's these galaxies that are so far away that light, fast as it is, would take billions of years to get from there to here. And there's, a, there's two things I'd say about that. First of all, you cannot use that as an argument against biblical creation because the Big Bang has the same type of problem. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, the Big Bang has what's called the horizon problem. It's not exactly the same as, as distant starlight, but it's basically a problem of getting light from one position to another in less time than the model itself allows. And I think it's very ironic that they pick on us for having a light travel time problem when they've got the same type of issue in their own system. And so you really can't use that as an argument against biblical creation. The second thing I would say is I think we now have a solution to the distant starlight problem. And this is something I've been working on for some time. Einstein recognized that what we call the uh, one-way speed of light cannot be measured. Now, in other words, I can, I can send a light beam, bounce it off a mirror, and measure the time, and I can get an average velocity. A lot of people will assume it goes the same speed that way as it does coming back. But you know it's impossible to measure that. Einstein huh. recognized that. He wrote about it, and uh, physicists who are well aware of relativity would be uh, aware of that principle. And so it's, it's certainly possible that the speed of light when it's moving toward us is infinitely quick. And I believe that that is the mechanism that the Bible uses in, uh, when God created the universe. And so the light was here immediately. As soon as God created the stars, the light can get here instantly. It's perfectly consistent with known physics. It's just not a lot of people have read about uh, Einstein, basically. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. And we have an article on this on our website, by the way, at AnswersInGenesis.org. It's called the Anisotropic Synchrony Convention. Anisotropic means different in different directions. So the speed of light when it's moving toward us is different than when it's moving away. And that solves the distant starlight problem right there. Dr. Jason, it's so good having you here. Well, I can't tell you, as a, as a pastor, uh, what a thrill it is to see that God is sending young men like you who have a grip of his word and a grasp of science and see that they synchronize perfectly. That's just, it's exciting for me to think we're leaving the next generation in charge with God's truth intact. So thank you so much for what you're doing. I'm honored to be able to do it and thank you for having me on the show. It's, it's great having you. Folks, I just want you to, to hear guys like Dr. Jason because so often when we say that we stand on the principles of God's word, we're mocked as if we're the ones who are ignorant. The fact is, when we look at the facts, they validate the truth of science. It always validates the truth of God's Word. And that's why I want you to always remember that it's God's view He created you. That should be your worldview, too. Thanks for joining us today on Origins. It's been great having you with us, and I hope you'll be with us next time. And until then, God bless you, my friend.